Good evening, everyone. Thank you for staying by for this final, I believe, presentation of this weekend. How many of you love Jesus? I mean, with all your heart. I want you to listen to something right now. Listen carefully. Tell me what that was. That's you in the presence of a holy God. Now I realize some of you are probably saying this man is a guest. He's not supposed to say things like that. Guests are the most qualified because we can talk and go. That's no way to treat God. Do you believe the truth shall make you free? Let me tell you some truth. This is the noisiest conference I have ever attended in my life. Now I am speaking on behalf of God because there is no quotation from the Bible or Ellen White you can bring to me to convince me God enjoy that kind of thing. When Eloi tells us angels fold their wings when they approach God. The Lord is in his holy temple. Finish it for me. Let all the earth. Let me ask you a few harmless questions. What is so wrong? Now, why am I talking to you so straight? Because, you know, I don't buy this theory of, well, young people have problems. Be gentle. Uh-uh. All human beings have problems. There are young people out in society, doing things, committing crimes, running in gangs, doing all kinds of things, and that's their form of strength. So you're not weak. I'm not saying you do that. You're tough, you're strong. You can take this. What's so wrong when you come into the presence of God in sitting down and just read your Bible? I'm about to talk about, I was sitting over here, and I have a message, it's called Not So, over there this morning. And two women began to talk. I hope they're not present. If they are, don't hit me with a cricket bat. And the Bible says, not speaking your own words. Have you ever heard that verse? It was one of the verses all Adventists knew a few decades ago. Not speaking thine own words. Even the conversations we have on the Sabbath day must be carefully guarded. Will some Adventists say Amen. And they launch into this discussion about some accident. <laughs> Two cars crashed. And uh, I knew one was West Indian because she said one car was mashup. <laughs> Only West Indians talk like that. <laughs> it's either mashed potato or mashed up car. <laughs> and gap insurance, whatever that is. And the, the, the insurance company couldn't get the edition she had, the car she had, had changing CDs and sunroof, and it made Yorkshire pudding and all kinds of things this car had. And I'm 15 minutes, now I'm not angry with her, so please don't hit me when I leave. And I'm listening, and I'm saying now at some point, one of them will realize, you know, this is not appropriate for the Sabbath day insurance for an accident. My brothers and sisters, this is supposed to be apologetics. I understand that. But the best person to defend God's teachings are those who understand them and practice them. Please don't treat God though so shabbily again. I ask you from my heart. 
I could not believe the level of noise. But everyone loves Jesus. So if you will consider what I say, and I haven't been harsh, I've just been direct. That is not the way to treat God. I was walking by, by somewhere, there's a young man sitting on a couch, and he was reading a book, nicely dressed. He dressed as though he was coming to church. And so I turned in my track. You know, when Moses saw the burning bush, the Bible says, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. So I saw this young man dressed and he's reading quietly. I turned aside to see this great sight. So I walked to him and I said, uh, what are you reading? Early writings. Now he's somewhere between 13 and 16. And, and I said, God bless you. And I walked away and my heart melted with joy. This young boy, sitting quietly now he could have been running around contributing to the high decibel of noise in the presence of god he sat in a corner and he's reading early writings one of the foundational books of the adventist church and my question to you is are you opposed to sitting quietly and taking god's word and just reading let me say something else you won't believe I love you. I'm your brother. I love you. And I want you to hear that before I pray and start the message. I've been a counselor most of my life. And sometimes I counsel literally with my fist in people's faces. Because they know I love them. And they let me do it. I speak from my heart, not my spleen. But someone has to speak for God. I know you love him. But perhaps now, the next conference you attend, your conduct will be different. Let's pray. Father in heaven, if I spoke too harshly, forgive me. And let no resentment build up in the hearts of your sons and daughters who sat so quietly and listened. Now, Father, as I deliver your words that I believe you've given to me, I ask in the name of Jesus to direct my thoughts. Give me the words to speak. Remember what was said in Jeremiah 1, 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Do that for me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject is, oh, when do I stop? That's not the subject, but when do I stop? When? 20 what? 25 past 9. Oh, I won't go that long. Please don't panic. I won't go that long. Our subject is, not so. Not so. Luke 1, reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Luke is the only Bible writer who presumably or supposedly was not what? A Jew. What was his profession? What other profession did he clearly have? Well, a preacher, yes, but what else? Based on the, his works. A historian. Modern historians who have studied the book of Luke have concluded that Luke must have been the finest of ancient historians. Every person he mentions, every place, every event is documented by secular history. That's a scholar who served God. You can serve God and still be academically superior. Luke 1, reading from verse 10. The Bible says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And the, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Finish that verse. And thou shalt call his name John. God told Zacharias through Gabriel, You will have a boy. Call him John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. Verse 14. And many shall rejoice at his birth. 
For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he bring to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people, what? Prepared for the Lord. Now, when the angel said that without taking a breath, Zacharias, quite naturally and as a human being, had the response you and I would have. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? Verse 18. How can I know this? Seeing. And he gives the human reason. Seeing. I am what? An old man and my wife well stricken in? Years. Made sense. He and she were beyond the age of reproduction, productivity, whatever. Verse 19, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel. You see, there's certain people you shouldn't doubt. Like the Bible. The writings of Ellen White. When Zacharias expressed doubt, now Mary said the same thing. In uh, the same chapter, Luke 1, in I think verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel had to explain the same angel. But he had the experience first with Zacharias. And Gabriel said, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. And have sent, I have been sent to speak unto thee and to shew thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season so gabriel said you'll be dumb for doubting not me really but doubting the one who sent me the one who authorized me it is dangerous to doubt god's word let's leave the drama right there first by recalling the information in verse 13 but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Gabriel, uh, fear not Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Finish that verse together, and thou shalt call his name John. Now let's go to verse 57. As we continue with not so. Verse 57. Luke chapter 1. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth what? A son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had shewed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they what? Called him what? Zacharias, why? After the name of his father. Now, I'm sure you probably know someone who has Junior at the end of his name. You know, John Jr., I don't know why there's no Sally Jr., but that's another story. There's John Jr. and Paul Jr. and Randy Jr. and Samuel Jr. and the second and the third and the fourth. That famous boxer, George Foreman, all his sons are George the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. Talk about child abuse. All of them. <laughs> and so it was a custom to name the boy, first boy, after the father. And so the Bible says it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. But look at 59 and look at 13. What is the problem? What's the instruction from above in verse 13? Call his name. What's the information from family and friends and the clan and the tribe and the culture? Call him Zacharias. You and I always face those situations. God says one thing. All our friends say something else. And we have a choice to make. God said, thou shalt surely die. Satan said, he shall not surely die. And Adam and Eve had a choice to make. The subject is not so. Verse 16. And his mother answered and said, what? Not so. Not so. But he shall be what? 
called John. Why? Why? That's what God said. God said, John, you and I must learn, regardless of what your friends say, the government says, your classmates say, or your parents say, if God says, John, you must say, John, with great respect. And so when they named him Zacharias, or were intending to name him Zacharias, the mother jumped in. Not so. Mm -mm. Forget it. But he shall be called John. Now verse 61 is one of, it contains a tactic that's used up to this day to change people's minds. The pressure of the group. And they said unto her, there is none of thy kindred that is what called by this name this has never happened in the history of this family this tribe does not do that this clan does not do that this tradition goes back hundreds of years and thousands of the bc era the first boy is always named after his father now who is saying that look at verse 58 her neighbors and her cousins in other words all the relatives all the friends and relatives and friends did not live far apart in those days as they do now now think of the pressure on elizabeth the guy is only eight days old so she's still perhaps recovering from the birth. And there were hospitals then, then as they are now. No anesthesia, no whatever. So she's probably on the bed or leaning on a stick. And they descend on this woman. All your family members, Elizabeth, and all your friends want him called Zacharias. You're just one person. You can't stand before the tsunami of tradition mm -mm. but clearly elizabeth did not budge why because she knew what god had said very clearly you and i must learn to develop righteous stubbornness in the book of call to stand apart page nine paragraph two ellen white writes of jesus christ at an early age Jesus had begun to make decisions for himself in the formation of his character at an early age, much younger than all of you. Well, almost all of you. Not even respect and love for his parents would turn him from obedience to God's word. And she concludes that statement this way. It is written was his reason for every act that varied from the family customs. Now let me simplify that. What she's saying is there were times when the family of Christ wanted to go west and Jesus says, no, that's not my father's will. I'm going east. At a very early age, Jesus had begun to act for himself in the formation of his character. Not even respect and love for his parents could turn him from obedience to God's word. I was talking to a young man several years ago at a camp meeting and there were tears in his eyes. Why are you crying? My father wants me to study on Sabbath. Here's an opportunity to make a decision for yourself in the formation of your character. So is your father an Adventist? Yes. Why does he want you to study on Sabbath? He wants me to get a high score on this, this entrance exam. Spoke to another young lady. Tears in her eyes. Why are you crying? My parents would encourage me to study on Sabbath, take exams on Sabbath. They wanted me to get to the very best medical school. And the moment I got into medical school, every belief I ever had was shaken to the core. And I have one foot in the world, one foot in the church. And the one in the world is on a banana peel. Listen to me. The Bible offers no justification for disrespect. It offers abundant justification for putting God first. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. When they could not get through to Elizabeth, righteous stubbornness. You see, people will keep at you if they think you're about to crumble. But when they realize that you are a brick wall of faithfulness to God, they go spend their energy somewhere else. 
Even the devil understands that. So the Bible says, resist the devil and he shall flee what? Flee from you. But the verse begins with, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist, he flees. Now he comes back, but he flees because he can only hit his head against the brick wall of your righteousness so long before he needs to go and take a break in the wilderness. So Elizabeth said, not so. Verse 62. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. Now, why are they making signs to Zacharias? He was dumb. So they went looking for the father. And there is no pressure like family pressure. There is no pressure like friends, good friends. That's why many of us get into trouble simply because we cannot resist the seismic force of negative influence from friends. You know, Christians are so afraid to do what's right. Almost as if what's right is an incurable disease like AIDS. No, sin is AIDS, not what's right. We're just afraid to do what's right because doing what's right makes me look funny. But Jesus said, yes, you're peculiar people. And they made signs to his father how he would have him come. And he asked for a writing table and wrote saying, his name is John. Praise God when husbands and wife agree. Can you say amen? amen? Now we have a husband and a wife up against the entire culture and clan and tribe and whatever else people break themselves down into. And when Zacharias said his name is John, the Bible says they marveled they marveled but the mother was clear not so she made a personal choice to do right in bible commentary volume 4 page 1164 paragraph 2 ellen white writes the 33rd chapter of ezekiel teaches us that god's government is a government of personal responsibility you choose Make a choice. That goes all the way to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, God came down and spoke to Adam first. He said, Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And finish that verse. I hid myself. Now think. In verse 8, the Bible says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Amongst the trees of the garden, Genesis 3.8. You take that, you may think it was a family decision. It wasn't, because Adam identifies himself separate from Eve. He said, I hid myself. That's personal choice. Now, on the other side of that coin, decisions for righteousness must be personal. You're not saved by families. But you can be lost by families. And so God said in verse 9, Where are thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now God spoke to Adam individually. He didn't call Adam and Eve and the serpent that triumvirate of rebellion against God. He dealt with them separately. When Adam had spoken, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. When he was done with Eve, he just cursed the serpent. And in verse 17, speaking to Adam, and unto Adam he said, because thou, now look at the word thou, as we continue with not so. And I want to stress personal choice in the face of overwhelming opposition. Because thou, the, the word thou is singular. Not only in the English, in the Swahili, in the Hebrew, in other language I have checked, it is singular. Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For thus thou art, and unto thus shalt thou return. It is thou, 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 individual accounting with God. And so in Genesis 2, 16, 17, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But when the devil came, he says, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not. That's group. That's plural. Lump the sinners together. Support one another in crime. 
When God came down on Sinai to declare the Ten Commandments, he did not say, ye shall not have no other gods before me. He said, thou. There were two million people at the base of that mountain. And God, looking at two million, saw individuals. And he said, don't hide behind that man. Don't hide behind that woman. Thou shall have no other gods before me. You. Yes, I mean you. Don't look around you. Personal choices. Because in the judgment, you don't take your mother with you. You don't take your spouse, the closest person on earth to you, other than Christ. You don't take the preacher who didn't preach a clear sermon. You take yourself and your refusal to make personal choices in the direction of God. And they said unto her, There's none of thy kindred that is called by this name. What pressures are you facing to act contrary to God's will? You know, Joshua was a mighty leader. And towards the end of his life, he called the Israelites together in verse 1, chapter 24. He gives a long speech like his predecessor Moses always gives speeches. And Joshua said in verse 15 of Joshua 24, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom ye shall serve. That's personal. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Now finish that verse for me. But as for, come on, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now Joshua says, me and my house. Is he included in my house? Yes or no? Come on, answer me. Yes then why does he say me and my house because while he is part of a family that's the house he understands within that family he has an individual responsibility to God that's the me one of the things that break my heart when I go preaching and conduct crusades and make calls for baptism some women are convicted but let me wait for my husband wait for your husband was it he who died on the cross? Is he the one who forgives your sins? What do you mean? Now, I don't say that harshly, but I'm saying it that way here to you. What do you mean, let me wait for my husband? As if you have signed a contract to live 50 years more from the time the appeal is made. You can collapse that night. You can't tell God, well, I didn't decide for baptism because I was waiting for my husband. The spirit that convicted you will convict your husband in God's time. Or I'm waiting for my wife. Don't wait for your wife. If the Holy Spirit convicts you to be baptized. Now my father-in-law, I buried him two weeks ago. God bless him. When he came to Michigan many years ago, he, uh, he was a Baptist or something. God bless all Baptists. Then he took studies with his landlord and found out about the Sabbath. He was convicted 10 years he studied, then he decided to get baptized. Well, the wife wanted to get divorced. She was dead against it. That's my mother-in-law. Sweet woman, loves the Lord in the church. <laughs> and she was mad. Now, if there's one person on earth you want to keep happy, that's your spouse. Even if it makes your children unhappy, keep your spouse happy. That's the closest bond on the face of the earth. Not mother and child, spouse and spouse. Don't look so shocked. Spouse and spouse. That's why Jesus uses that to describe his relationship with us. My mother-in-law rushed to the library every day doing research to try to overthrow her husband's arguments and studied herself, as so many people do, right into the baptismal pool. <laughs> Have you ever heard stories like that? I'm going to learn, and then next thing you, what happened? You just got baptized. But he was willing to go through what? Divorce, yes, hell. <laughs> That's a good word for divorce. He was willing to go through hell. Why? Because he was convicted. He was right. Ah, my brothers and sisters, we must learn to say not so. God says, John, if the entire nation of England says Zacharias, say, John. You know, in John chapter 7, you read that the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him. 
So at some point, Jesus led a fairly lonely life. Because John 7, 5 records clearly, neither did his brethren believe in him. If Jesus had succumbed to their negative influence, he would have ceased to have been the Savior. Because they would have led him into sin. When you allow your knees to buckle in a situation where you've got to decide between right and wrong, you rob that person with you of an opportunity to see a righteous person in action. I didn't say that clearly, my fault. You see, God does not come down to this earth and show people what righteousness is. He uses the church. And so as I said, I believe it was this morning, in uh, Genesis 39, verse 2, the Bible says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 3, And his master saw that the Lord was with him. He saw and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. His master saw it. How did the master see it? By the upright, consistent life of Joseph. When Joseph, Jacob fled from Laban in Genesis 30. In verse 37, 27 of Genesis 30, Laban told Jacob when he was about to leave actually. He said, I pray thee. If I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for thy sake. You are either a curse or a blessing. And that choice of only two goes all the way back to Genesis. Where God blessed the animals, blessed the animals. Then, of course, he cursed the serpent. He cursed the ground for Adam's sake. We have blessings and curses. When he called Abraham, he said in verse 3 of Genesis 12, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. That's it. And so the child of God is either a blessing or a curse. When you shy away from that which is right, because of pressure from your friends even some of them who are in the church but let's forget those and talk about those outside the church you deprive them of a demonstration of faithfulness to Christ that's a curse there are young men who need to see what an upright moral pure-minded young man is like because they don't see it it's not on television it's not in the magazines it's not on the school ground so there are very few examples of morally upright young men because even the man in the church the young boy in the church is bombarded by I don't know what shows you have in England but this music show and that dance show and it is something in the U.S. called 106 and Park. Do you have that over here? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And all the rappers and the singing and half-naked girls. Every rap video. Am I lying? A half-naked woman. Gyrating. And the lyrics is a man left a woman. Or man is, uh, you know, some man ran some... Uh, but, uh, uh, and that's all we listen to. That is what is fed into our... Because so many parents don't even monitor what their children watch. If I had my way, I'd put so many parents in prison. And double up their punishment by making them vegetarians. <laughs> parents don't even monitor their children. You know why the young folk would come here and not sit quietly and read the Bibles? They weren't taught. Parents, don't take out your weapons and shoot me. You shoot God, not me. They were not taught. You can see when a child is taught. It's a crime against your children. To have a child grow up in the church and does not have the habit of reading the Bible and you're telling me that you taught? You taught what?
Young people, if your parents haven't taught you, forgive them. Now you're the age where you can make decisions. Forgive them. Make some intelligent decisions for yourself. Learn to say, not so. You know, when the angel told Mary she'd have a child, <laughs> I wish I could have been there somewhere behind a cloud listening to this discussion. You see, when you have a consciousness of doing right and someone suggests something wrong, you're shocked. Mary knew she was an upright young woman. She knew that. She had chosen to live that way. That's why when God was looking for an upright woman, who can be the mother to my son? He didn't make her upright then chose her. She was upright when he chose her. He didn't make her upright on the spot. She lived that way. So if God were looking for a mother for his son today, he should find someone in Birmingham who's an Adventist. Who fit the criteria. So when the angel said, you'll have a child. And Mary knew she had no man. Mary <laughs> said, wait a minute, angel. I don't mean to be rude, but please explain. How a woman who has no man does not play around, does not do these things, can ever get pregnant. And the science of intravenous, whatever that thing is, had not yet been invented. How? You see, that's the question when your, your friends try to get you to sin. How? How is it that you would suggest that to me? Smoke? You obviously don't know me. We've sat in school for two years and you suggest I smoke? You don't know me. And perhaps it's my fault I haven't made myself known. I don't do this. You know, when I was growing up, there was a, there was a term called infradig. Ever heard of it? No. Go to the dictionary and learn what it means. It actually means infradignitatum. It's a Latin, expression, a Latin expression which means beneath one's dignity. And when, when I was growing up, children in my age and time would, ah, that is infradig. <laughs> I don't do that. Now, I may do that, but I'm not doing this. That's in its beneath. My dignity for a Christian, it's beneath my righteousness I don't club I don't do that have sex with you you're not my husband or my wife let's not even have the discussion because if Eve had cut off the discussion quick we would not be here today. Let's go and smoke dope. <laughs> not so. I don't do that. It's infra dig. It's beneath my dignity. I live by the words of God, not the words of society. God said, John, It'll be John even if I die a lonely death. You can make a personal decision to do what's right. You can make a personal decision to begin a life of prayer and study. You can make a personal decision to really give your life to God. Because he's already paid for it with the blood of his son. So by giving him your life, you're giving him what's his. By withholding your life, you are guilty of grand theft. Because the life is not yours. I believe, and I'm, I'll close, it's 5 to 9, I won't go to 9.25, no way. I believe in your heart really is the desire to do what's right. But it could be you're scared to death. You don't have strong examples that can sustain you and buoy you up. There's no example in the home. Poor examples in the church. And the pressure of standing alone is so great. You buckle and you buckle. But in your heart, just like Mary Magdalene went into prostitution, in and out and demon possession. Some scholars believe Christ cast out demons seven times rather than seven at one time. But that woman had a heart to serve God with all her struggles. 
whatever your struggle is give god the heart to say no to sin the heart when abraham was informed by god he should sacrifice isaac abraham got up saddled his ass took two of his young men with him and isaac his son genesis 22 verse 3 and he went off and when god saw how determined he was to do it god said there's no need that's the kind of heart I want. A heart that's made up. A mind that's made up. Make up your mind tonight to be faithful to God. One day at a time. Just one. Make up your mind to be in deed and in truth a Seventh-day Adventist young person. You heard Brother Justin say earlier today, this church was begun by teenagers. Ellen White, 17, James White, 19, Jane Andrews was even younger than that. Teenagers started this church because they, you see, being 12 doesn't mean you've got to be immature and silly and stupid. At 12, Jesus looked into the eyes of his earthly father and said, wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. He knew his mission. When I travel, if I didn't travel, I would make excuses for Western society and the way we make excuses for young people but because I travel and I see how other young people behave and act and respond to responsibilities when I go through Tanzania I like to go to the countryside you see those Maasai ever heard of the Maasai now cattle is their culture you drive down the road you see a little Maasai boy maybe eight years old with a stick leaning on a stick and he's watching cows now he is not leaving those cows to go play <laughs> if he has to play he plays with the cows but he knows that cows are so central to his culture if he loses one. And the little boys. Now, someone would come along, if this were United States or England. Oh, come on, he's only eight. Come on. Mm -mm. Children can do more than we give them credit for. They can learn more than we give them credit for. I was in, where was I? Somewhere. <laughs> and I saw a little boy he couldn't have been more than three or four naked as a jaybird he has a stick in his hand and he's driving a cow home now me I'm gonna run from that cow cow was big but a little boy he has been trained from a small age cows are your life little naked boy running down the street behind a cow and the cow is running from this little boy <laughs> but he's driving it home he knows that's his life And you've got 13 year olds and 14 in England and with the United States, and we're talking about well, they're young. Mm -mm. Mm. You mean that nonsense about you're young? She's young. Oh, is that a he or she? Whatever it is, that child is young. <laughs> huh? I make excuses for that baby in the mother's arms. I'm not making excuses for him. Josiah was eight. The Bible says he did what was right. He never veered to the left or to the right. He was eight. Don't tell me about a 14-year-old. Let's be easy on him. There's a little boy in Zambia. Zambia, Botswana. He and I correspond. He's memorizing books of the Bible. When he emails me, I thought it was his mother writing for him. He's homeschooled. Loves the Lord. Eight. And uh, I just love emailing that little boy. <laughs> you think he's 11 or 12? In Botswana. Loves God. I was in Bangladesh. And I'm going to finish, don't worry. Then a week of prayer to school. On the school ground was a, an orphanage for little children this big. We met twice a day, seven days. Every day the little children came. Maybe three or four or five. They sat, their legs couldn't reach the floor. They occupied the first two rows on the right side. They never got up to go out. Listen to me carefully. I'm not lying. God is listening. They ne at least I never saw it. They hardly ever talked. I mean three, four, five, six. That's it. No one was given a cracker. What do you call it over here? A biscuit. A scone. <laughs> 
And I watched them every service. I said, but this is not what I see in the United States. People bring groceries to church. <laughs> and they condition their children to expect a meal during the service. And children drawing on the tithe envelope. And the mother sitting there listening to this sermon to change her life. And her child is drawing on the tithe. The preacher says, Matthew chapter 6. And instead of the mother saying, Johnny, find Matthew 6. Now, teaching the child, the mother, or the father. And then we, when they get older, you start bothering the preacher. Pray for my children. I'm saying a lot of things in this sermon because it's my last. And you may never invite me back again. <laughs> you don't know how my heart is heavy and pained. One more story then I'm finished. This young lady in Bangladesh came to me. I was doing counseling after I preached or before preaching. She called me uncle. That's how they called you. She was 16 or 17. Very attractive young lady. Face like a flower. Eyes like stars. Smile like milk. And I'm sitting, she's talking to me and her eyes are flashing. Because this young boy said he liked her. But there's no law against that. And apparently he didn't understand how serious she was at 16. So he, she said to me, she said, Uncle, this boy came and told me he likes me. So I said, okay, but don't touch me. <laughs> and she looked at me as though I, has, I was trying to touch her. I said, no, no, she said, no. I told him, don't touch me. If you will like me, let's go talk to my parents. And bring your parents, let's discuss how much you like me. And I am looking at this little girl and I can't believe it. I've never met this in Western society. In Western society, a boy says, I like you. The last person to know. <laughs> you find out when you don't want to find out. Let me close the book to put your minds at rest. Let me ask you something. Do you want to go to heaven? No, I'm, I'm serious. You want to? Do you know what happens to people who are lost? Tell me what happens. Where do they go? You don't know? What happens in the lake of fire? <laughs> no one talks about hell anymore because it doesn't bring large offerings. But you need to understand there is a reality called hell. It's not going on now, contrary to what most churches preach. Hell is not so much a place, it's an event. You know when Elijah was on Mount Carmel with those 850 priests, and went there, prayed and cried and shouted and cut themselves and bailed it and answer. When it was Elijah's turn, he dug a trench around his altar. Remember that? First Kings 18, I think. He poured water all over the, the altar, all in the trench, all over the sacrifice, so that they knew, they would know there's no trickery. Then he prayed. Now, whenever a fire breaks out, what's the first thing you see the fire people do? Water. Universal response to fire is water. But when God's fire came, it consumed the water. Now that is not supposed to happen. That's why you can't put God's fire out. That's why the Bible calls it an eternal fire. Not because it burns and burns, but it burns until it has burned up its objective. And no one could put that fire out, so the fire destroyed that which normally destroys fire. Now that's the kind of fire that will be in hell. So you can't spit on your hand to ease the pain. Don't go to hell. Don't go. Go to heaven. Go to heaven. Hmm? No sickness. Literally. God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. Revelation 21.4 And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Don't go to hell. Go to heaven. Young and old. But you've got to make individual choices for yourself. The devil has so many young people on his side. He does not need you. 
but he wants you because each young person he gets it puts another cut in the heart of Jesus you see Satan can't get to Christ personally but it would cause Christ less pain if the devil could slap him what the devil does is hurts us and that tears up the heart of Christ now that's a mother now if she had to choose for me to slap her or her baby how do you think she would choose slap her because it would tear her up for me to slap her baby that's the way it is with God and Satan knows that and Satan uses us to hurt God now why cooperate with Satan to hurt the God who gives you the breath you breathe now tell me what sense it makes it makes none choose right say no to wrong and if you fall get up don't admire the view get up tell God you're sorry cry a little bit move on I want you to make some commitments right now I want to talk to the young men first God made you leaders from Adam down that hasn't changed I don't care what liberal theology you hear the man is the leader in the home and the leader in the church I never said the man was the boss in the home and the church I said he's the leader two different things men young men well any man big men little men is it in your heart to represent God when you leave this place will you say in your heart father this message has touched me and other messages have touched me this week Lord I'm not sure how I'll do it but please at least I can give you a heart I want to represent you as an upright child of yours one day at a time if there's a man young or old who will say that stand up don't take a lot of time I have to get to the ladies just stand up don't look around to see who is standing you stand up question two of those men standing which of you is not yet baptized raise your hand quickly okay two who else you're not baptized three who else four who else all right those of you who raise your hand take your hands down can I talk to you personally the rest of you don't sit what are you waiting for hey, what else do you need to know I, I speak as your brother what else do you need to know one of the tricks of the devil is you got to learn some more so the people told Christ if you're the Christ come down we'll believe you if you come down they would have said now jump over that bridge we'll believe you that's the way the devil is do you know enough to decide you know Jesus wants me to be baptized do you know enough how many of you who are not baptized you want to be baptized now raise your hand you want to be let me see your hand God come 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 quickly come 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 quickly you want to be you're not but you want to be come come men 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 come God bless you God bless you I mean it God bless you I am not baptized I want to be baptized I'm not saying today or tomorrow I have a desire I'll get together with my pastor my God we'll set a time God bless you God bless you my brother God bless you look like a preacher God come 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 God bless you I am not but I want to be come anyone else coming we have a little time left come quickly I wanted to finish but the Lord put it on my heart to make this call someone else I am not baptized but I want to be you and your pastor can set the date I want to be come come don't be afraid just come God bless you God bless you ah my young brother God bless you nice to see you nice to see you nice. please pray in your hearts that others may come anyone else any of the young man I'm not baptized I want to be come I have to move to the ladies come I'm not baptized I want to be come I want someone to come and take the names someone come quickly take the names please hmm say that you're doing that now okay someone else come finish this more quickly come this way that way. let's get these names get them to the proper churches any other young man I am not baptized but I want to be come anyone else ladies let me talk to you 
as the young men write. Ladies, young and not so young, if you will say, Father, I give you the heart tonight by your grace to live an upright life that brings glory to your name. If there's a lady who will say that, that's my desire, ladies, stand up, if you'll say that. While you're standing, which of you standing, you're not yet baptized, raise your hands, ladies. You're not yet baptized. Raise your hand, can I? I need to see them. Raise them, raise them. Bless you, God bless you. Who else? Not God bless you, God bless you. Now, same question as the men. If you would like to be at some point in the future, come. Come, come, come. God bless you, sister. Blessings on you from the bottom of my heart. God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. Come, God bless you, God bless you. Anyone else? Ladies, I'm not yet baptized. I want to be. Delay is deadly, says Ellen White. Come. You don't have to know all, everything in Scripture to be baptized. Come. Someone else. Lady, I want to be baptized, but I'm not yet. Come. Any other young man? Come. Not yet baptized, but I want to be. Come. Let's move quickly with the names. Anyone else? Come, sister. God bless you. May God bless you and use you to lead others to Christ. Come. Someone else. I'm not yet baptized, but I want to be. I really am a good person, but I have struggles. Come. Final call. I used to walk very closely with Christ. I have backslidden. Listen closely. I have backslidden. No one knows but God and me. I've hidden it well. But my life has been touched today. I want to come back to Christ through baptism and never leave him again. Anyone who will say that, come. I need to be rebaptized. I have backslidden. I have broken the covenant with my Savior. I want to reestablish it the way it was the first time through the waters of baptism. You come. I have backslidden. Come. What time I have? This is serious. Anyone else? I have backslidden. I need to come back to God seriously. Come. On the card, we won't put backslidden. We'll just put your name. So it's okay. We'll just put your name. Come, sister. My brother, God bless you. It's a tough response to make, but you made it. You'll inspire someone else to come. Someone else. I have backslidden. I want to come to Christ and be faithful. God bless your sister. Every name, get them. Anyone else? Call number four. I am not a Seventh-day Adventist, but I have been hanging around the church. I have some friends. I'd like to learn more about this church. If there's someone here like that, let me see your hand. I'm not an Adventist, but I'd like to learn more about the church. Is that a hand back there? Come. Come. Someone else. I'm not an Adventist, but I want to know more about this church. Come. Now, this name we've got to get. Come. God bless you. God bless you, my dear sister. God bless you. God bless you. Fine-looking young lady, God needs you in his kingdom, not out in the world. And the rest of you. Get her name and be sure to put non-SDA so we know. Anyone else? I think I made these calls for baptism, for men, for women, Rebaptism and those with an interest in the church you want to know more come those are the four calls plus giving your life to Christ fully and I need to pray and send you home God bless you sister God bless you God bless you God bless you how are we with the names okay we're moving well now I'm gonna ask you a final thing and if you're not serious don't respond many people say pray for me and we say okay and we go off and we forget that's very serious. If you will remember from time to time, I make it easy for you, to pray for those who responded. You don't need their name. Just say, Lord, remember those young people who responded March 22nd at the last service. Bless them. If you remember from time to time to do that, don't raise your hand if you don't intend to. If you will try to remember and pray for them, raise your right hand. God bless you. Right. Turn around and see those hands. Look at those hands. Look at those hands. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Okay, that's prayer support, which is powerful, hands down. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, we come into your presence to thank you for your power. Your elastic patience that stretches almost endlessly. 
Lord, for the blood of Jesus Christ and for the work of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of these young men and these young women who have responded to the call publicly and demonstrated the courage. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, the God, to touch their hearts. Somehow let them understand that you love them personally independent of everyone else and it is your desire to save them from the perils of this world and into your kingdom dear god in heaven surround them with your spirit and your angels that the devil may fail in his attempt to turn them back from this decision then use their lives immediately to influence others for good Please hear the prayers of those who will support them in prayer. Bless the parents. Forgive the parents for being sloppy parents. And show them the light. Please hear this humble prayer, my God. Touch every heart. And save us all when you come without the loss of one. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen. And amen. God bless you. We've got your name. Please return to your seats. We hope we have your emails as well somewhere to contact you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.